A warm welcome. I'm Robert Dyker, the director of the Institute for Advanced Study, and it's uh, wonderful to open this meeting, which actually I think is in some sense the first in-person conference we've had in almost two years. So by by far, this will be the best conference I've attended in, a, <laughs> in the last two years. Uh, no, it's wonderful to, to, to welcome you here and, and Martin when you approached us, this, uh, this possibility to have the uh, this wonderful award of uh, the Clay uh, Prizes here, I think we were immediately open to it. So it's uh, it, it's it, it's it's a great honor for us to host you. And then, so warm welcome also to re representatives of the Clay family and uh, and of course by the for the prize winners. And I think we'll have some wonderful lectures here. Also, just want to say how special it is that we have these uh, awardees here. Actually, if you look at the uh, list of uh, prizes awarded in the past. Uh, would say that puts a lot of pressure on anybody who gets that award because the people typically go on uh, a much higher, uh, you know, uh, achievements in the field of mathematics. And I think I also want to express my thank to uh, Clay Mathematics Institute because has been doing such a terrific job in supporting mathematics. And uh, it's it, it's something that you know we here at the institute feel very closely connected to and I think your, all your efforts are extremely appreciated and in particular the way you've been supporting young mathematicians which are the way to uh, for us to go to the future so I think it's all coming together and uh, I think we're in for a treat today and again you know, very honored to have you here so welcome to the Institute for Vet Study. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. So it's a great place to be here. I want to immediately say how grateful we are to, to the our colleagues in the Institute of Advanced Study for, make, for helping us make this happen. Uh, the Institute of Advanced Study, of course, is famously devoted to truth and beauty. And uh, the uh, stated purpose of the Clay Mathematics Institute is to further the beauty, power, and universality of mathematical thought. So it's, it's natural we should all be friends, maybe we're on the same track. Um, so we're delighted to be here. I want to welcome not only the people in the room, but uh, the many more people joining us around the world on Zoom. Uh, the Clay Research uh, Conference is the highlight of, of CMI's year, and COVID robbed us of it completely last year, and it was trying hard to do the same again this year. So we're very grateful to our colleagues here at the Institute in Princeton for helping us to fight back against COVID and, and stage this uh, mathematically exciting event today. And as Robert was saying, this is a re-emergence of in-person events for the IAS, likewise for, for the Clay Institute. This is really the, the post-COVID rebirth for us. Um, so um, in Clay Math, we, we have a tradition of, of, of minimizing non-mathematical speeches. So I'll stop with that, but it's a fine tradition it is. Um, and introduce today's uh, first speaker. Um, um, so the first speaker today is Laszlo Dekihidi, <laughs> um, uh, who is uh, from Leipzig, who's, who's the Distinguished Visiting Professor here uh, at the Institute in Princeton this year for a special year um, on a topic closely related to, to many things that we'll hear about today. Uh, his many distinctions include uh, the Open Wolfack Prize and, and the Leibniz Prize, and that he's um, famous for, for developing uh, the applications of, of convex integration to, to fluids, uh, which we're going to hear a lot about today. So it's an absolute pleasure to have him. And uh, he's going to talk to us, as you can see, about convex integration and synthetic turbulence. Thank you very much, Martin, for these kind of introductory words. And thank you all for coming. Thank you for the uh, invitation to be here. It's This is a Fantastic occasion! I'm very happy to to see uh, Vlad and Tristan. I I don't know if uh, or if Phil is is uh, joining us online. Um, uh, so um, yes, so I'm I'm very honored to be here. So my my talk will be about um, the topic that I've been interested in, also jointly with Camillo, and uh, which is also part of the uh, uh, team of the special year this year at IES. And uh, it's also something very closely related to the work of, of, uh, of Tristan, Phil and Vlad, but it will be my own personal point of view on of this topic. So I will leave some, some more things for Camilo to say about uh, the, the work of the ORDs. 
So um, synthetic turbulence is, a, is, a, is a, um, an expression that was coined by Greg Eiling, I believe, and it just refers to something where usually in, if you're talking about um, partial differential equations, you, uh, the equation gives you, you know, their, its own properties, its solutions, and so somehow it has the upper hand. And synthetic turbulence and convex integration somehow turns the cards around. Uh, you play the equation. You are somehow, you're forcing the equation to admit certain solutions. And what I want to convince you is that this is actually an interesting game also maybe from the application's point of view. So, um, since the uh, uh, Clay Award is uh, traditionally uh, in Oxford, uh, it, I think it's quite fitting to start with an Oxford quotation. This is by Cyril Hinchelwood, who got the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. There are several chemist Nobel Prizes in this, in this particular subject with mechanics. Um, he said, fluid dynamicists are divided into hydraulic engineers who observe what could not be explained and mathematicians who explain things that cannot be observed. <laughs> now, to be fair, he said this about 19th century fluid mechanics, uh, but I think that uh, quite a lot of what he said applies even to, uh, to the 20th century and even the 21st century. And, uh, and one of the challenges is, is, is just to close this, uh, this gap between, between these two communities. So I want to give a couple of classical examples of, of this division between theory and, and, and observation. Uh, this is the most classical problem, I guess, in, in fluid mechanics, to calculate the drag force um, for the flow around the sphere. And, um, and this was already studied by Newton in his uh, Principia in 1687. And he gave a formula that involves uh, the um, uh, density and the uh, velocity of the uh, fluid and the um, radius of the sphere. And this is actually a very quick proof in this book. It's uh, basically just uh, saying that if there is a formula based on these, um, on these uh, parameters, then it must be this one, just by dimensional analysis. Uh, a century later, D'Alembert also gave a formula, which is a famous formula uh, called the D'Alembert paradox, um, which is very different from Newton's, F is equal to zero. Uh, so there's no force acting on the sphere. And uh, uh, almost 100 years later, Stokes revisited this and uh, gave a formula that essentially agrees with D'Alembert's, but also applies to viscous flows. Now, um, the three formulas are very different. And what's interesting um, is that Newton, so D'Alembert's and Stokes' formula is derived from the PD. They are derived from the equations of motion but Newton's formula is not, um, and it looks very different. However, it turns out that uh, all of them were right in a sense uh, in certain situations. So the situation, what situation they are, they are, they are correct, and when they're not is determined by the Reynolds number. The Reynolds number is a dimensionless quantity uh, that essentially describes how turbulent a flow is, and um, so it turns out that at small Reynolds number, if the flow is laminar, there's no turbulence, then most uh, essentially the Stokes formula is correct. Whereas for large Reynolds number, Newton's formula is essentially correct. And I just uh, gave two pictures from the famous album of Van Dyck to demonstrate what is laminar and turbulent. Although I, I expect that most of the audience, or at least a large part of the audience is very familiar with, with this topic. Um, so I just want to point out that this large Reynolds number regime is not actually something uh, astronomically large. It's actually essentially an everyday, it arises in everyday situations such as uh, behind the golf ball or, or a car. So it's not really something uh, out of the, you know, very disjoint from everyday experience. Um, the second example is even more everyday experience. This is the, um, the setup is that you have um, a flow coming out of a pipe uh, with uniform velocity U, and there is a, a, a ball balanced um, on, on top of this um, on top of this setup. So I have this picture by my colleague Jonas Hirsch from Leipzig, who is one possible experimental setup. Um, <laughs> and uh, another one, which is um, 
quite usual in sort of um, uh, so there's, there's my daughter also a little bit in the background. Uh, you see these type of experiments. I think there's quite a few uh, features of this type of uh, video that, that would deserve a careful study, but I just want to focus on the most basic feature, which is that the, uh, the ball can actually be balanced, which means that the vertical position above the, the pipe is stable. Now, um, of course, this being a kind of very popular experiment, there is also a popular explanation for it involving the Bernoulli law, but uh, I think that that explanation is essentially at the same level as the explanation using Bernoulli law that um, planes can fly. And uh, the true explanation is much more complicated. Um, so Landau, in the, so this is actually in the book of Landau Lipschitz, looked at this, um, uh, at this uh, particular setup, at least in a, in a kind of um, uh, idealized situation where the uh, diameter of the, uh, of the pipe goes to zero, and studied the, the associated PDE, which is the stationary Navier-Stokes equations. Um, and uh, he calculated a, a precise formula for what is the uh, velocity and what is the pressure distribution um, it's of course it's it's rotationally symmetric, and this red curve is the uh, is the pressure distribution uh, at a certain distance above the um, above the uh, pipe. And what you see is that it has a maximum exactly at the axis of symmetry, which contradicts the observation that this is a stable position. If this was the true pressure distribution, the ball would never stay there. Okay, so that's another example where theory and, and observation contradict each other. A third one, which, uh, which already featured in uh, last week's and uh, weeks ago in the postdoc talks and will feature uh, also prominently in the work of, of, um, of Tristan, Phil, and Vlad is what is known as anomalous dissipation. So in the, um, in the Navier-Stokes equations, um, the uh, uh, energy dissipation rate, formally at least, is, is, a, is a, a proportional to the viscosity, which is essentially, you can think of it as something uh, reciprocal to the Reynolds number. So very turbulent flows would have, roughly speaking, a very small viscosity in this formula. So the expectation would be, the naive expectation from the PDE is that um, as the Reynolds number goes to infinity, the energy dissipation rate should go to zero. But this is not what is observed. What is observed is that as the Reynolds number goes to infinity, the energy dissipation rate uh, um, approaches a certain constant up to some kind of accidents, which, um, which are even more complicated to explain. But it essentially stays above a, a certain, certain positive value. And um, so that's, um, that again seemingly contradicts the, um, this formula. Of course, not exactly because you could have nu go to zero and this uh, uh, gradient squared go to infinity. Uh, by the way, so this observation is in agreement with, with the Newton's formula in terms of dimensional analysis, much more than, uh, so it, it, it's, um, okay. it agrees with Newton's formula. So these are three examples just to demonstrate that there is a big divide between PDE and what we can prove rigorously from the PDE and what we observe. That's why I think that um, Hinshelwood's quotation still applies today. Um, now, John von Neumann, um, when he was already at the Institute, I believe, um, wrote a fascinating article on, on the state of the art of, of, uh, of turbulence. And uh, this, is a, this is one of my favorite uh, quotations from that, that article. One has to talk not of one turbulent solution, but of many turbulent solutions. There is probably no such thing as the most favored or most relevant turbulent solution. So I would say, that, at least for me, the message of, of Neumann is that the issue of uniqueness, one of the standard questions in PDE, is overrated. You should think about existence and other properties, but uniqueness is not really the uh, correct question if you are speaking of, um, of turbulent flows. 
And uh, of course, this leads one to think about weak solutions. Another, you might say, artifact of modern mathematics, but this is actually quite old. So let me just digress to say what are weak solutions. Um, Euler wrote down the Euler equations in, uh, in 1757. And uh, what they actually represent is just the, the uh, continuum formulation of conservation of mass and conservation of momentum. And if you take a particular, uh, some, some uh, subdomain of the, of the, um, of the uh, domain where the fluid lives, uh, V, and then integrate the divergence, <coughs> the second equation, you, you get this red formula, which basically just represents the fact that the same amount of, of mass is going out of, the, of that particular domain as what is coming in at any moment of time. Uh, the same way this, this uh, uh, second um, formula represents that the amount of momentum leaving a certain domain is the same, which is the amount of momentum coming in. So again, um, uh, so these are sort of, um, these red formulas are representations of conservation of mass and momentum, but there are no derivatives. So these red formulas, which you can also think of as a definition of a solution, of the Euler equations do not require any differentiability. Now, uh, to, be, to be fair, um, this is not how Euler derived these because um, Gauss actually uh, was born 20 years later. Um, okay, so actually the wave equation was the first PD ever written down and already for the wave equation, there was the question of weak solutions. So D'Alembert, um, uh, uh, derived the, um, the, the formula of the general solution of the one-dimensional wave equation as a sum of, of two traveling waves. And of course, he claimed that, well, these F and G have to be twice differentiable, otherwise the equation doesn't make sense and the physics doesn't make sense. And Euler, um, there was an interesting fight. I will mention some of this next week, some self-advertisement. Uh, between D'Alembert and Euler that went about for 20 years. Uh, Euler claimed that, well, but look, I, I take these non-differentiable solutions, non-differentiable functions f and g, and I still get I still get a solution. So why is it not working? And it was it was essentially Lagrange who who resolved this um, dispute between Euler and D'Alembert and came up with what we would call now the uh, distributional formulation of the um, of the equation, and uh, and uh, Leray was um, did the analog for for the Navier-Stokes equations. There's another uh, way to think about non-differentiable solutions, which is by uh, taking a, um, a Fourier series, and of course um, uh, this was this was introduced for the context of of fluid dynamics by Ensemble for the Euler equations. So, okay, so it does make sense to look at weak solutions, at least um, it's something historical from that perspective. Since Helmut said I look like a historian, I'm making these historical remarks. Um, uh, however, there's a problem because there are strange weak solutions. So this is a result of, of Schaeffer from the early 1990s. There exist non-trivial weak solutions of the Euler equations with compact support in space-time. So these are solutions that are zero at a certain moment of time, then they're not zero at a later moment of time, and then they're again zero. So they contradict any sort of physical intuition about what the Euler equations should represent. And they also contradict the uh, conservation of energy, which this formula should follow from conservation of mass and momentum. It's even worse. Um, there's, does, apparently, in the class of weak solutions, there is no real evolution. So you can connect any initial velocity field and any final velocity field um, by a solution of the Euler equation. So that's, there are infinitely many weak solutions that start at V0 and end at V1. <clears throat> now you might say, OK, but this is the Euler equations. So OK. Uh, in the words of, of uh, Sasha Schlierman, the Euler equations represent a fluid that has been stripped of all its properties except the property to occupy space. So, uh, but the same thing 
uh, appears with the uh, Navier-Stokes equations. It is the famous result of, of Tristan and Vlad. There exist non-trivial weak solutions of the 3D Navier-Stokes equations with compact supporting type. So the same result as, as the Scheffer result in, 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 uh, for Euler. And also, the, um, there's also no evolution. In the same way, you can connect any two uh, velocity fields by a weak solution of the Navier-Stokes equations. So there's clearly something wrong with, uh, with the notion of, um, of weak solutions. So uh, to look at this, this question of what a weak solution, what properties it should have and what should be its definition, I want to talk about um, the question of stability and closure. And this is motivated by, uh, at least my work is motivated by work of Tartar, um, who said that the only thing about turbulence that everybody agrees upon it is created by oscillations in the velocity field. And I should say, he actually says, when I talk about oscillations, I actually mean oscillations and concentrations. <laughs> so, um, so the uh, uh, classical closure problem in turbulence is uh, you have a turbulent velocity field, and you think of that as, as, uh, as the sum of a kind of average uh, plus a fluctuation, where the average could be a long time average. This is what, what Reynolds introduced, uh, or it could be an average over ensemble, uh, which is uh, the Kolmogorov point of view. And um, uh, okay, so the question is, uh, you know, since this fluctuation is, is, is pretty wide and, and difficult to, to either measure or, or numerically simulate, what is important is to understand the average. And so the average will satisfy an equation. I've, wrote, I've written it down for Euler, but you could do it for Navier-Stokes as well, um, uh, which involves the, uh, the terms of the Euler equations plus an extra term, which is uh, called the Reynolds stress term. And it arises from the uh, uh, difficulty that um, uh, uh, taking product does not commute with taking averages. So it's the difference between the average of the product and the product of the average. Okay, and one can summarize the closure problem in this way. What is the equation for this R? We have too few equations here. There's an extra unknown that we have introduced. And the only thing you know about just from, from averaging is that this is a non-negative tensor, but that's all. Does it satisfy an evolution equation or are there at least more constraints? Now. Um, there is a, there is a um, so, so the problem is that averaging is not really well defined. So one could consider weak convergence as a, as a um, substitute for averaging. Uh, this has been for, in the context of, of fluid mechanics uh, introduced by the Perna Maida and then later uh, Tartar um, in the context of, of uh, uh, wave equations by, by Peter Lacks. So instead of averaging, we think of a sequence of velocity fields. They could be solutions or approximate solutions, and they converge weakly, which means averages are converging. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a similar type of decomposition. We have an average and a fluctuation. But nothing changes. It's the same problem that, uh, that uh, the operation of weak convergence does not converge with uh, nonlinearities. So it's the same, same issue about, the, about uh, the, the question that we don't know what is the equation for R. However, now we have a very well defined um, mathematical framework. And in many cases, you can actually say something more than just um, uh, abstract averaging. Uh, so in order to motivate this, motivate this let me digress and, and talk a bit about a classical problem in homogenization what is called as the G-closure, uh, question of G-closure. So here, this is, think of the following uh, 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 problem. You have two metals with different conductivities and you want to combine them in a certain, in a certain way to end up with some, some um, metal alloy with some interesting property, like different type of conductivity. So here, think of uh, this particular example, the conductivity, this is a two-dimensional example, uh, is given by these given by these matrices, um, 
one is black and the other one white, and this is the sort of um, metal alloy <coughs> dimensional domain. And so the, the question is, what are the properties of, of, um, of the equation when we have this kind of combination? And more precisely, we could think about uh, repeating this pattern periodically, and then in the kind of weak limit, we have a sort of average. But the question is, what is the effective conductivity? It's not just simply the average of these two matrices. And more, moreover, it's not just that for this particular configuration, what is, the, what is the effective conductivity? Can you characterize the whole set of all possible effective conductivities? That's the G closure question. And so the question is really about replacing one particular equation, which has sort of uh, pretty rough coefficients, by a whole family of equations. This makes the problem, it's originally it's a linear problem, now it's a nonlinear problem, but it's still easier to say something about it. So this is a, this is a classic, I just drew this picture if you're familiar with how to compute the uh, uh, G closure of this set. It's something that's, uh, it's not even a sort of um, a, a one dimensional set of conductivities. It's a two dimensional set of conductivities, which is what I find interesting. So in particular, you can combine isotropic materials with isotropic conductivities and get something that's not isotropic. Okay, so, um, now, in, in, in fluids, uh, the uh, question could be formulated as follows. So this is a very rough, please excuse me, this is a, a very rough cartoon picture. Think of an initial data V0. And then, of course, classically, you might want to, to study, you know, how does that, uh, uh, how is the evolution under the, say, the Euler equations or the Navier-Stokes equations. And just to keep something in particular in mind, let's say that it's a sort of Kelvin Helmholtz initial data, okay? It's unstable. So now take a small ball in L2 around this initial data and just try to understand how that whole ball deforms under the evolution. Now, the typical way to observe things is to take averages. So the natural observation, uh, the natural thing in, in, in this picture would be to take the weak star closure of the, um, of the uh, um, image under the evolution of this ball. And then let the size, so instead of the typical thing, which is I think time going to infinity, um, let the size of this, uh, of this radius go to zero. Can we characterize the, the limit of, of these sets as the radius goes to zero? And the problem is that uh, in, in this particular case, it's, it's known from experiment, but it's very difficult to prove anything, is that it's, it's unstable. There are certain certain uh, uh, vortex structures created, even if the initial initial perturbation from the uh, from the flat case, the the, the flat Kelvin Helmholtz interface is is uh, is very small. So it's not really clear what to expect in in this limit. But uh, uh, my my point is that in this way you again study a question about stability of the equation under weak convergence. Because my, what I want to understand is not what is this set, uh, uh, this, this intersection, but what is the equation that describes that set? Okay? Just like in the G closure problem, it's not that we want to understand the set of solutions, we want to understand the set of equations that characterize this, this, this limiting process. And so this is, this is sort of um, uh, a way to, 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 to study relaxation and the reconvergence, and uh, it's it's a uh, okay. It's a kind of deterministic analog to to um, to study uh, the question of what is what 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 describes turbulence. Um, so here uh, there's a formal limit, of course, from the Navier-Stokes equations to Euler equations. This is what was studied by Onsager. Uh, the weak convergence limit is was introduced by Dipenna and Maeda. Um, and uh, whatever way you do it, you end up with some kind of set of subsolutions where there's this Reynolds stress. And uh, where this is where convex integration comes in, there is a kind of new arrow connecting weak solutions of the Euler equations to this set of relaxations. 
it tells us that whatever uh, a limiting set of equations we got here, they actually correspond to, to um, true solutions of the, of the Euler equations, even if it, it's only in a weak sense. Okay, so I want to, uh, okay, so this is a kind of meta theorem to, to explain what, I'm, what I was trying to draw in the previous slide. Um, if you take sort of strict subsolutions, so that means solutions of this relaxed system, there is this Reynolds stress R, and strict means that now it should be strictly positive. We want to avoid the zero case. And uh, then the sort of meta statement is that any strict subsolution can be weakly approximated by weak solutions of Hölder class with exponent one third up to one third. So this is a, a, a big theorem that uh, uh, was motivated by the Onsager conjecture, and I'm sure Camilo will talk about that. So I don't want to talk about that anymore, but give some other examples of the um, um, of this principle of studying the uh, stability of the equation or closure of the equation under weak convergence. Okay, so going back to the Navier-Stokes equations, let me just recall uh, what Leray proved in his paper in 1934. So he proved the existence globally in time of weak solutions, which he called turbulent solutions. Um, and the, the method of proof relies on the following strategy, which is called compactness strategy. Um, first of all, you look at what natural estimate you can, you can derive from the equation, at least for smooth solutions. And in this case, it's the energy inequality, which is a little bit more than just saying that the kinetic energy, in fact, it's a lot more than just saying that the kinetic energy is, is, is decreasing in time, monotonic decreasing in time. It also includes the cumulative uh, 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 dissipation rate. And um, uh, so this means that if you look at the set of solutions with say initial data uh, um, bounded in L2, then this set of solutions will be in space time bounded, bounded in, in these two spaces. They will be uniformly bounded in L2, uniformly bounded kinetic energy, and the uh, uh, cumulative dissipation rate will be also be bounded. So L2 in time, the H1 in space. So that's the first step of, uh, of Leray's proof. The second step is to come up with a kind of approximation, regularize the equation because it's difficult to treat directly the, um, uh, the nonlinearity and um, and, uh, and show the existence of these um, approximate solutions and then pass to the weak limit. We have a weak limit because we have boundedness in a certain, sub, uh, in a certain Banach space. And uh, since there is this uh, bound in H1 and it embeds compactly in L2, that allows one to show that the uh, weak limit of, of this quadratic nonlinearity is actually a V tensor V. So in other words, in this, uh, uh, a philosophy that I was presenting earlier, there is no Reynolds stress. Reynolds stress is zero in this particular situation. So the limit will be a solution. Now let's look at in contrast with uh, what, what Tristan and Vlad uh, proved, it's non-uniqueness and let's say wild behavior. So wild behavior just refers to these weird statements like you can get from any velocity field to any other velocity field, all the kind of uh, contradictory seemingly contradictory um, statements. Um, so we are talking again about the uh, uh, weak solutions of the um, Navier-Stokes equations, but now we don't have the energy bound. So uh, the solution is actually bounded in, in, uh, in the energy. So kinetic energy is again bounded and one derivative is integrable. So it's in the Sobolev space W11. But in three dimensions, this does not embed into L2. So the uh, upshot of that is that there is nothing preventing uh, uh, Reynolds stress to be generated in this weak limit process, as in the general case that I presented earlier. So, um, uh, okay. So that's the, that's the difference. We're looking at a different class of solutions. And in this class of solutions, the equation is not stable 
and the read closure. And to see that in a, in a sort of larger context, in that paper uh, uh, generated a lot of activity in the field and um, the various results um, exploring the bounds of, 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 of the technique of, of, um, of their paper. One is that you can, you can uh, raise the power of the Laplacian. And uh, if you do that, instead of looking at um, uh, solutions with um, um, uh, one derivative um, integrable, you're looking at two gamma minus one derivative being integrable. And you can check you know, what is the uh, critical embedding here, and it will be exactly if the power gamma is five fourths. So correspondingly, there's this uh, the work of, of Luo and, and Titi. They show that the same result as uh, one of Bookmaster Vico holds also for uh, uh, powers of gamma less than five fourths. Um, and let me also mention, because they're both here in the special year, uh, Alexei Cheskidov and, and different Luo, um, which is also a result of solutions of the navier stokes equations in another space that does not embed into L2. Okay, so just to uh, uh, have you know, <coughs> a family of equations where you see this, this divide between, between compactness and wild behavior, you can look at the P Laplacian. So here the, um, the uh, uh, viscous term is, is the P Laplacian or could be P Laplacian type. And then what changes in the, the Ray framework is that the energy inequality now um, you have the Pth norm of the gradient. That's the only difference. And you can again check Lerel's proof. The Sobolev embedding uh, will, be, uh, will be valid if P is bigger than six over five, the embedding is compact. And correspondingly, Lerel's proof by a compactness works if P is bigger than six over five. And the same wild behavior that, uh, that Tristan and Vlad showed works if P is less than six over five for Leray Hopf solutions, but now because of this compactness, it fails. The equation stops being stable under the convergence. My second example is uh, the 2D vortex sheet problem. So if you remember the picture from my, my introduction, there is this uh, uniform flow and then a sphere and then some sort of really turbulent behavior behind the sphere in this wake. And uh, one classical way to study this that I think was introduced by Bachelor is, um, is by looking at a plane perpendicular to the, to the direction of the flow and, um, and look at the uh, divide between the laminar and the turbulent region or laminar and another laminar region is the original one. So the picture is not completely correct for this particular um, argument, but let's say it, this is the curve which is uh, the boundary of the, uh, of the laminar region outside. And then a kind of model problem is to assume that we have a dynamics on this plane <coughs> of this curve, where now the, the vorticity, the jump in velocity is concentrated on this curve. Right? The vorticity is coming from the jump in velocity. And then you can write down um, a, a, a well-defined evolution equation for um, <coughs> for this um, uh, for this problem, because you can you can so from the curve, from the shape of the curve, and the vorticity strength on the curve, you can uh, uh, calculate the velocity. And so here is the um, oops, I think I'm jumping ahead of myself. So, okay, so that's a bio savar law just to how to calculate the velocity. So this is the initial initial configuration. Uh, where the uh, uh, vorticity is just concentrated on this curve. And uh, um, Leray's strategy, the compactness strategy was implemented by Delors in 1991. Global weak solutions proved the existence of global weak solutions, provided that the initial vortice density is, is um, positive. And uh, so the strategy involved, again, starting with a kind of um, a priori estimate, an estimate that is true for, for smooth solutions. And uh, because of the vorticity equation, 
the uh, total mass of vorticity is preserved. And so that gives, uh, that gives an, an a priori bound. And then passing to the limit, I'm skipping the step, which is the approximation. Passing to the limit involves basically showing that uh, uh, under these conditions, the divergence is zero and the uh, rotation the curl is given by a positive measure, then uh, there are weakly continuous quantities. And this was the um, realization. Of the <coughs> this is an aspect of it's called com uh, compensated compactness. And uh, in terms of the framework I was sketching earlier, this means that uh, in, in passing to the weak limit in the nonlinear term, there is a Reynolds stress, but it's, it's, uh, it's a, a multiple of the identity. And so being a multiple of the identity means that you can put it on the pressure term. And so even though we don't have strong convergence of the velocity fields in this, in this weak limit, um, the equation is still stable under weak convergence. Now, there is another uh, way of, of um, um, studying this problem. Um, uh, as, I, as I said earlier, you can calculate from the vorticity, you can calculate the velocity. And if you assume that the vorticity remains concentrated on a curve, then you can def uh, uh, calculate a, an expression for how the curve should evolve un uh, in, under this evolution. This is called the birkhoff roth equation. And uh, the, the problem is that, although this is locally well posed for analytic data, it's still posed essentially for all non-analytic data. Non <coughs> and, uh, and the reason is that um, uh, uh, small perturbations end up uh, uh, being very large in time. Now, so these two approaches to, to defining what is a solution, each one has its advantages and its disadvantages. The advantage of Delors approach is that you have a global existence for a large class of initial data, but the disadvantage is that you don't actually know anything about the structure of these solutions. It's, um, it's just an abstract existence result. The advantage of this one is that you see exactly what is happening with the uh, solution under the evolution, but it's, it's basically imposed. It's difficult to show even existence for a large class of initial data. So uh, an approach which is somehow in between the two follows from these ideas of, um, that I presented earlier. And this is work with Fran Mengual, who is also here, and he talked about this in his short postdoc talk. Let me just recall the basic idea. So we can prove the existence and the non-uniqueness of, well, non-uniqueness of weak solutions, which are energy uh, is decreasing. And uh, the, the, um, so the vortex sheet, the initial data is a vortex sheet, but it can have a changing sign. And so the idea is that um, uh, we make the following ansatz. For positive time, there is uh, that the initial vortex sheet is evolving in time but it's also opening up. So there's a kind of uh, tubular neighborhood or turbulent zone around this curve that is opening up. And uh, uh, okay, so this is maybe um, video, yes. So, so you see that uh, the curve itself, the mid curve, this would be the uh, uh, evolving of the initial, initial vortex sheet. This is moving in time, and it's also opening up into a region. Inside this region, we only have a weak solution. And outside the region, the solution is still analytic. There's no vorticity. So the vorticity is spreading inside this region. And um, the way to think about this type of um, uh, uh, construction is that we actually just need to construct the subsolution. So we need to construct this Reynolds stress and so it's not so good to think about the closure problem, what would be the equation of R. It's better to think of it as a control parameter. You're trying to maximize something or minimize something. The same way as the effective conductivity is something that an engineer would think of as a control parameter. And uh, in, in, in with this geometric ansatz, that control parameter can be, can be uh, um, thought of as a, as a way, I mean, kind of geometric control. We just want to, so given 
the shape of the turbulence zone, which is determined by the evolution of the mid curve and the size of the uh, uh, growth of the um, growth of it, uh, that determines R by just solving a, a boundary value problem. <clears throat> and so, so what? So and if we optimize over all possible shapes of this turbulent zone to achieve maximal dissipation rate, then we get something that at least to the naked eye looks like it's, it's enclosing the possible uh, growth of vortex, vortices coming from uh, perturbations of the, um, of the flat sheet. So um, let me just say, so here we are taking not a mathematician's approach, but more an engineering approach where the benchmark is given by the picture should look nice, correct. It's not, not much more than that. We are constructing solutions, but okay, that's all. So the third example is uh, um, it, concerning the MHD equations, three dimensions. Uh, so just to say what it is, you have the Euler equations coupled with the Lorentz force. Um, so there's a magnetic field B. The magnetic field is uh, solving the uh, uh, Faraday Maxwell equations uh, with Ohm's law. So the uh, electric field is given by the cross product of the magnetic and the uh, uh, velocity field. And um, this system of equations has a large, uh, a, a very rich structure. The total kinetic energy is the total energy is conserved, just like for the Euler equations. But there are two more. Uh, conserved quantities known as cross helicity and magnetic helicity. And uh, so the, um, of course, there are analogously to what happens in the Euler equations, there are criteria on the regularity of the solution, um, which uh, lead to conservation of total energy, cross helicity, and magnetic helicity. But it turns out that this, uh, the magnetic helicity has a very special uh, properties that is that is somehow more subtle than, than, uh, than the other two. So I want to talk about this a bit. Okay, so what is the uh, uh, physical significance or what, what kind of phenomena one is aiming at? Well, if you, so, so in, in reality, there should be some viscosity and some uh, uh, magnetic resistivity in the system, but um, uh, what is known uh, from, from observations is that um, in a kind of turbulent regime where both of these both of these um, parameters are small, um, there are kind of two time scales. There's a short time scale over which the kinetic energy is dissipating, so the fluid, the plasma, comes to rest more or less. Uh, but on a much larger time scale, the magnetic uh, the magnetic field also comes to a certain rest, but not to zero, but to some kind of um, steady state. <clears throat> the steady state would be the global minimum of, um, of uh, uh, magnetic um, energy subject to uh, the given helicity. And so this is something that's, uh, in, uh, this question is important. It's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a NASA um, a project studying how this can happen by kind of like, uh, uh, vortex reconnection, magnetic field reconnections. Um, it's uh, important to understand this because of uh, solar flares, the speed of, 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 uh, of um, uh, energy dissipation in solar flares. And uh, uh, mathematically, what is complicated is that if V goes to zero first, then there is nothing that the magnetic uh, field can do other than just uh, also put to zero. So this reduces to the heat equation, but this is not what, what is observed. So uh, uh, this system, at least part of this system, has a special uh, structure in terms of the PDE. Um, the Faraday system is a, is, a, is a standard example of what is known as the diff curl lemma. Um, which basically means that, uh, uh, that the um, product of E times B, the scalar product of E times B is a, is, a, is a weakly continuous quantity under certain conditions. And this is important because this is exactly what uh, determines 
the evolution of magnetic helicity. And so using this uh, uh, structure, <coughs> Hilberg, Danny Farako will also join the special year in January, um, showed that if uh, nu and eta go to zero, consider the limit of, of uh, Leray solutions of the MHD system, then magnetic helicity remains a conserved quantity. Uh, and so somehow we need, a, we need a, a notion of weak solution that has these two aspects. On the one hand, it is uh, supposed to conserve magnetic helicity, because that's what observations tell us. And on the other hand, it should have anomalous dissipation of total energy and cross helicity. There are these two requirements from observation. And so that's, that's where weak solutions come in. And, um, and there are two recent results. One is by uh, Vicky, Tristan, and Vlad, um, who show the existence and non-uniqueness non of weak solutions, which do not conserve the energy and cross helicity, but they also do not conserve magnetic helicity. And, uh, and uh, uh, with uh, Farako Lindbergh, we showed that in, in a different class, you can, you can find solutions that actually conserve magnetic helicity, whereas they do not conserve uh, uh, energy and cross helicity. And so the difference in the two results is the um, integrability in space. This is in L2, this is in L infinity. And it is known, I don't want to go into the details, that, that in this class, a fortiori, magnetic helicity has to be conserved. Let me just say, what is the, the basic idea to, that ties in with what I was trying to explain in the general uh, framework? Um, it's the question of stability of the equations under the conditions of you know, what type of solutions you're looking for. Solutions which are L2 integrable or solutions which are bounded. And uh, if you're looking for bounded solutions, the uh, 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 tartarmura Divker lemma, which was two slides before, will tell you that there is a certain uh, special structure in the Faraday system, which is this one coupled with this one. So this is the Faraday system. In the, uh, in the MHD equations, the electric field is a cross product of uh, magnetic field and the velocity field. Uh, that doesn't have to be preserved. It's again a kind of, um, it's, a, it's nonlinear. It's a product of two functions, just like V tensor V in the uh, hydrodynamic case here. So the, if you have the hydrodynamic part of the relaxation, there's a Reynolds stress term. But this one, there's, there's, a, there's a ghost remaining in the, in the weak limit, namely that the magnetic field and the electric field have to remain perpendicular to each other. And so this is, let's say, the, the main observation. And if you look at this, this relaxation and then use a kind of meta theorem, like uh, the one I mentioned in the context of the Euler equations, that leads to this type of design. Okay, so... Um, that's it from me. Thank you for your attentions and congratulations. Thank you, Leslie, for a beautiful lecture. Um, we don't have capacity to take questions from our online audience. But is anybody in the room who would like to ask a question? Uh, um, well, I'm interested if you could say a few more words about what it might mean for for physics or fluids. If in some sense this solution is not unique, does it mean that in principle, some data at the atomic level is needed to pick the right solution? Uh, yeah, of course, that's a good question. Uh, I would say it's, um, maybe it relates to this, this um, cartoon picture that I was trying to show. Uh, you see, if, if you expect, or if you believe, uh, that in, in this limit, if rho goes to zero, um, you don't get a single solution. Let's say even V0 has a well-defined trajectory to Vt. But if you, if you make small variations of V0, um, it's unstable and the set somehow, I'm not very good at drawing this, but it will be very large, this, uh, the set after time t. And, uh, and even as rho goes to zero, 
that set will not shrink to a single point. So this non-uniqueness is supposed to represent that, that, that set. So it's kind of like the um, high frequency limit of, of, uh, of you know, taking perturbations and then looking at the evolution. That's how I would think about this. It's not that um, you know, that particular initial data has more than one solution. It's that it's so unstable that if you're not completely sure about what the initial data was, you will see a whole, whole bunch of possible uh, realizations. But then should that be described, you know, probabilistically or stochastically or somehow? You could, you could do, I mean, that's of course, you can, you can instead of a set, you can take a measure and, um, and look at the evolution of that measure. But I don't think that the picture would be very different. I mean, the, uh, so uh, this is why I, I wanted to cite Neumann, because if you introduce a probability measure, you have to, I mean, you start to think about what is the most preferred solution. I'm not sure, I'm not sure that's, uh, that's a good way to think about it. So two questions, just kind of following up on this. I mean, but could you think about it in the sense of, follow, in the same sense we think about there being a non-unique characteristic, you know, for a single, for Lagrangian particle motion, connecting something and that being a source of dissipation. It'd be fine if there were many non-unique, I mean, if there were non-uniqueness coming all together and that was somehow some idea of dissipation, right? Does that fit into the way you think about this? So that's kind of maybe what Tom, I mean, I don't know, I want to put top words in Tom's mouth. Non-uniqueness of Lagrangian I mean, in the sense, I mean, that's what that's what stochasticity gives you, right? It means that there are many paths that could have brought you here and then you get some averaging over that. That's kind of a loss of information. So in the same way, if there's no, no if there's many paths that could take you forward here, that would be a source of dissipation, except at a kind of a higher level in a way. Yeah, I think you could think of it that way. Or, or I mean, you can also formulate the Euler equations as a variational problem uh, in a Lagrangian setting, and uh, that's a highly non-convex. So I don't know what would be, you know, what happens, what happens if you, you, you know, there's many ways you could realize a minimum, for the displacement problem and, uh, and take some kind of average of that. Is, is there something, you, why did you go to MHD? Is there something extra degree of freedom there that's useful in some sense or is it? Well, it's kind of this, uh, it has both these features. It is, it is stable to a certain extent, but not completely stable. So it has, it has the, uh, the stability of, uh, of magnetic helicity. Hmm. Um, but the same kind of um, anomalous dissipation of energy. That's why I thought it's a nice, it's a nice example. Anything else? Well, that's, that's what we're going for beautiful lecture.